Welcome to Expanding Space, Newsweek's deep dive into the cosmos, from the moon to Mars and beyond. Featuring insight from top experts, scientists, and former astronauts, Expanding Space will push the boundaries of what we know and what we have yet to discover. I'm Joshua Rettmiller, Chief Investigative Reporter here at Newsweek. Today's guest is Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. He's also the director of the Fells Planetarium at the museum, which is one of the best places in the country for young people to learn about space. Uh, thanks for joining us, Derek. Let's thanks for started. having me, Josh. Mars has been a hot topic, especially, obviously, uh, SpaceX's Elon Musk has has been speaking about Mars uh, for years. NASA has had it in its horizons uh, for decades. President Trump has been mentioning it on the campaign trail and then during his inauguration. Can you speak about that for a minute, just the prospect of us going to Mars and what might that really entail? You know, the idea of an expedition out to Mars is inviting and tantalizing for anyone that has any sort of romantic ideas about exploring space. Often our endeavors in space exploration uh, are shown to be just beautifully futuristic and wonderfully uh, sort of sleek and streamlined with a, a, a design element that looks towards uh, elegance and speed and all of these other great qualities about know how it could be how we want it to be how we fantasize it to be uh, but the, the the truth of the matter is is when you actually start to look at the reality of what it takes to for humans to explore space it's a very different reality and it's a different reality because space is not a place meant for humans it is you know we we've all seen the references uh, to the concept that space can kill you in a hundred different ways without any problem at all and so for us to explore anywhere outside of the earth's envelope of life requires us to mitigate as many of those possibilities as possible and this is true this is true for mars it was certainly true of our explorations of the moon that we had to beat down all of that risk in order to make it successful travel time is probably one of the first you know issues that has to be dealt with so if we're thinking about a trip to mars the minimum amount of time it would take us to get to mars at our current level of technology the minimum amount of time is six months if we're talking about a trip to mars that's going to last six months just to get there let's also consider the human needs which uh, is like you have to carry everything you need your food your water your oxygen your protection, anything that's going to sustain life, sure. you have to carry all of that. Right. And it has to be like probably levels more redundant than previous systems, right? Because you're going to be so isolated. That, I mean, once you're out there, you're out there. And so there's no there's no rescue. Right. Let's be frank about it. If uh, if a crew headed to Mars runs into trouble, there is no rescue for them. If we send astronauts to the moon, the moon is three days away. If there's a real problem, I mean, we could get it together to launch a rescue mission to the moon probably within a month, you know, maybe two months, okay? But for Mars, there's no rescue. Can you maybe speak about the scientific payoff of all this? Like, I know that we could potentially confirm evidence of past microbial life there or perhaps see how this is all connected and by this i mean the cosmos but can you maybe perhaps speak about the potential payoff of actually digging into mars more well Just the scientific payoff of digging into mars more is better understanding how these planets have come into existence and what their histories have been however we can do more with the moon for example one technology we might, one thing we might look at in terms of scientific payoff is you might look at the soil of the moon and think about what strategic minerals we might be able to find there that we might be able to mine easily enough that can benefit 
life here on Earth. If we try to think about something like that for Mars, we run into the difficulty now of then moving that material from Mars back to Earth. That takes energy, it takes fuel, it takes spacecraft, it takes infrastructure, all of those things. But again, the moon is a lot closer. What did you think about the nomination of Jared Isaacman to be the next NASA administrator? I think nominating Isaacman for the position of administrator of NASA is is, is really a, a you know a breath of fresh air and a great way to open the doors for innovation and uh, you know different kinds of partnerships for NASA. My my only concern is that. NASA is a very complicated bureaucracy, and it requires experienced people to see to it that it is run efficiently and can accomplish all of the goals it needs to accomplish. And so what it needs are people that are experienced in space, in space exploration, in running space businesses, and running, you know, large, you know, American bureaucracies. That's right. that's really important. So I think if Isaacman can have the support that he needs of experienced people that are already there in NASA, and if he takes advantage of what connection he could have with past administrators, then he could do okay. I think there's a, instead a whole culture, a whole internal culture shift at NASA, that has begun, sure. but needs to continue. How exciting of a time is this right now in space exploration? It seems to be a very, very, like a flashpoint almost. Yeah, you're right. It is very much like a flashpoint. And it's a, it's a flashpoint because we are, or, or an inflection point at least, where we stand at this opportunity to change how we approach launching uh, payload into space by shifting to a system that's entirely, you know, a reusable system. That's a huge step forward that is such a game changer in the whole industry. And the other thing that's a huge game changer is that a few years ago, NASA started to promote the concept that it needed to reach as far and as wide as it could to find the brains it needs to solve the problems of future space exploration. So gone from NASA are the days of, you know, the crew cut white male with, an, with a string tie, short sleeves and a pocket protector. The concept of diversity for NASA is extraordinarily important because in internalizing diversity, they've now opened themselves to find the brilliance they need everywhere. And it's really made a huge difference for them. And they need to continue that push with that concept strongly in mind that diversity is their greatest asset. That's a beautiful sentiment and it's absolutely true. We get so much more together. And as you said earlier, I, I mean, the more minds on this, the better, it, the better chance that we have of actually accomplishing these goals yeah. and, so, yep. and so the best of the best uh, it comes from all t from all types and backgrounds and, and so that's what we need um, yeah right. that's really true and that's really been beneficial to nasa and uh you know the, the the more diverse thinking we can get we'll find the ideas we'll find the understanding we'll find the talent to be able to solve some of these problems Thank you so much, Derek. You've been an absolute pleasure. Um, Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at Philadelphia's Franklin Institute. Please go check him out. He's an absolute treasure. Thank you so much, Derek. Josh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed doing this and look forward to another opportunity to work with you. Thanks so much. Oh, by the way, yes. despite everything I've said, if I had an opportunity to go, I would still jump on a spacecraft and fly to space anytime. <laughs> Me too. Let's do it.